uh, expanding the intros today to include shtick. <laughs> Thank you. What? Shtick. <laughs> we've, got, we've got a little shtickle of shtick on the uh, oh, okay. <laughs> on on the uh, intros for today. Is Bill going to juggle? Uh, Bill, <laughs> do you juggle? I juggle. <laughs> do you just juggle? Words, just words, so you have to understand. Them. <laughs> well, we can do that. We, we can do that too. So, but uh, anyway, as we uh, move this along here, we'll get it started. And we go a little something like this. Hit it. All right. Now, you're coming up soon here. All right. I remember Connack the Magnificent with Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show. And if I were to resurrect that late night soothsayer, here's how it would go. Mike Carl sends me the same text every Thursday. It's true. So here comes Mike Carlnack without further ado. Now, that's the first part of this. Now, now the part of the next is the shtick. I got Gilstrap involved in here. And for that shtick to work, I also need the appropriate music, so... I have in my hand an envelope. This envelope has been sealed in a hermetically sealed cremation urn from Brown's Funeral Homes and stored in the conference room of Burke, Schultz, Harmon, and Jacobson for 12 hours. No one knows the contents of this envelope, yet our host will be able to give you the question, the answer, We'll be able to, we'll do this better when we rehearse it. Our host will be able to tell you what's in this envelope without ever looking at it, as I hand it to him right now. God created the earth in less time than it took you to give me this envelope. You have to put it through your forehead. That's the way Johnny did. And there's a lot of forehead. Do not heckle the host. <laughs> I hold in my hand the final envelope. The final envelope. All right. <clears throat> the final envelope is in your hand right now. Cormac requires silence. <laughs> I think silence is abundant throughout the listening area right now. Due to this, Except to this for thing. a minor sound of weeping. <laughs> may, or gasping in fear. May a deranged roto rooter man service your daughter's plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Zeus. Zeus. B. Arthur. B. Arthur. And Joe Biden. Zeus, B. Arthur. <laughs> And Joe Biden. Yes, I just said that. Come on, come on, I, just said <laughs> I said it better. <clears throat> <clears throat> Name a god, a mod, and the world's biggest fraud. <laughs> <laughs> that was your introduction there, Mike. Well, thank you. <laughs> it rhymed and it was good. <laughs> Did you enjoy it? <laughs> yes. All right, well, Was good. it short enough, Mike? <laughs> yeah, <right>. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, we tried a little shtick on the program. Thank you, by the way. Ed, you need to close it with a hi-ho. Hi-ho! There we go. <laughs> really, rehearsal is important. We just didn't do that. It is. <laughs> but I liked it anyway. You did, you did pretty good there. All right. Now, on to Larry Schultz. <clears throat> with all the subtlety of a charging Brahma bull, Republican social warriors kept Larry plates full, Larry's plate full. With calls for parents' rights so long as they agree, Mr. Schultz kept watch on this 60-day far-right spree. And when it's all said and done on these Charleston scenes, Larry's bumper sticker will read, Guns in the classrooms, but not vaccines. <laughs> it is great to be here. <laughs> great to have you. Still? Still. <laughs> <laughs> um, he doesn't mince words when he speaks his mind. He made his opponent cry during a debate, I think you'll find. If you ask his opinion, you may find his directness uncouth, but that's only because you can't handle the truth. If you got it coming, don't try to save face. If you're expecting nuance, you came to the wrong place. If you were thinking it but felt you couldn't say it, he says it out loud, then asks me to replay it. He calls it like he sees it, and he speaks his truth with passion. You're talking to John Gilstrap, the social assassin. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ferretti, you're up next. He made his living by invoking the law and made a good buck by flapping his jaw. But lately he's been puzzled by a lack of common sense by those in the Capitol who pay 60-day rents. 
They're rolling back protections on measles, mumps, and rubella. They want to arm the teachers, even that really odd custodian fella. <laughs> and for those that disagree, for those of that ilk, Joe Ferretti says, let them eat cake dipped in raw milk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thanks to the station owner. <laughs> Uh, it was this date in 1872 when Yellowstone became a national park. Bill Stubblefield's been there. He hiked in the dark. Now, you may not know this, but old Billy was tracked by a man-eating grizzly. And that, my friends, is fact. By day and by night, it stayed on Bill's scent until three days had passed and our man Bill was spent. Fearing for his life, Bill had yet one trick remaining. And that was to offer the stuff where his food was containing. So with determination, he swallowed his fear and well masked it and offered that grizzly bear the full contents of his picnic basket. <laughs> Good morning, Bill. It was a major sacrifice to Rob. It must have worked. He's here. It is. Now, we move on. Thank you uh, again, Ed. To our, our, our first segment of the day, let off by jo- Joseph. Joey Torts ready. Joe, you're on the clock. Okay, I'm going to get right to it before we lose any more listeners, Rob. Um, <laughs> let, John Hardy... May the ghost uh, of Nikola Tesla zap on all of your radios. <laughs> John Hardy's appearance uh, the other day on the show, Rob, really got me thinking about Generation Z. Now, Generation Z are those folks born between 1990 and 2010. They are now entering their mid-20s and mid-30s, armed with their technical degrees, college degrees, and professional degrees. And they're looking for jobs and looking for places to live. Politically, um, they're defined as being somewhat progressively, uh, uh, progressive on the social issues, but also um, economically, they're seen as pragmatic, sometimes even considered moderately conservative. They're tech savvy, as we know, because we run to them to fix our cell phones. They're open minded and they welcome diversity. That's pretty much the definition of a Generation Z member. And oh, by the way, folks, they are the largest generation in the history of this nation. Population wise, now they comprise 27 percent of the United States population. So we got to deal with them. What, now, what we know is happening in West Virginia is that we're losing population. And, in fact, we're losing this generation Z. Uh, we, we're down 68,000 people in the last 10 years. We've lost the congressional seat. We've lost more people. The rate of loss exceeds all other states in the union. So what are we doing to fix this problem? Because I have long thought that we're not going to turn the corner in West Virginia until we keep our best and brightest, until we reverse the brain drain, and until we get young people to see West Virginia for a land of opportunity. So my question today is, look at your state legislature and tell me, make the case, if you will, how they are engaged in public policy debates and developing public policy to address the interests of this generation. What do you think they're doing to convince folks born between 1990 and 2010 that West Virginia is the place to work, live, and raise a family? Go ahead and make your case. Mike Carl. Well, I I agree with the premise of the issue and the question you've raised, and it's a serious problem. And what we need to do is uh, continue to improve our economy and and stop wasting all the time that we've talked about a lot here on on these you know crazy social issues that that, that ignore reality. So we and and I think there's bit progress has been made, but but we have a lot more to do. And and you know I have three children in that uh, age range and. And only one of them is working here, and he's he's working for the for the WVU. So you know, you can't say that has much to do with the private economy. Billy, yeah, uh, Joe, you're raising a very good question, and you mentioned John Hardy's name, and I want to come back and applaud John as well. Uh, John gave the crisp most crisp definition of why he was not running the other day in the uh, the interview by saying that the the uh, Chamber of Commerce Republicans are being 
overstepped, overridden, overinfluenced by the cultural warriors. Uh, we see this on a lot of what's come out of the, this particular session. Uh, the transgender bill, the vaccination to some degree, uh, the uh, uh, the. Uh, the teacher carry all of these can be viewed in one way or the other as social issues social warrior issues uh i thought dr moffitt hit the hit the point very well when she said the vaccination bill which probably it has as deep an implication as anything they've addressed this time were not vetted by or her opinion and her colleagues were not asked by the uh, uh by the legislators uh this has become a political it's always a political body but i think it's become a social political body more than what we've had in the past uh i'm uh, uh for years uh the republicans said well the democrats are running their, ramming everything down our throat if we just had a chance to to move it back to substantive issues we'd do that well now the gloves on the other foot it has become a supermajority of the republicans and as hoppy kirchhoff said the other day they're doing anything they want to do Bill, you get the Mixed Metaphor of the Year award on that one. The glove is on the other foot. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rob, Rob, That's when you know it's time to go to a that's home. That's right. Exactly right. <laughs> Rob, at least you were listening. John Gilstrap had tuned me out. <laughs> I was on the edge of being tuned out until that. That got me right back in the game. I'm not sure how you wear the gloves in your family, Bill, but that reminds me of a, my college football. Football coach Dan McCann was asked about uh, a particular uh, team we were playing that week, and he said, we've got our hands really cut out for us this week. And I thought, well, that's going to make it difficult to catch passes. <clears throat> so. Yeah, on that subject, Yogi Berra is on uh, documentary is on uh, Netflix now. And watch it just for the yogis. <laughs> yogi <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Schultz. Um, yeah, it's a... Uh, difficult thing i guess my answer to joe's question is zip zero not a nothing they're doing nothing uh to keep that thing here but there's an additional metric and that is to the extent that we are replacing these 22 year olds who bolt for other states we're replacing them with retired um urbanites from the dc metro area and so they move when they're 65 here and replace a 22 year old (laughs) and they have a great demand for medical services the medical industry loves to see them but what i hear from my friends is then they they're here for 15 years they're 80 years old they have a lot of health issues and all their specialists are in washington dc so some of them are now moving back and getting apartments in dc so they can go there spend the night and I really don't believe that our legislature has taken this seriously at all for the last couple of years. And it is going to continue and maybe even increase in pace if they don't start. And and Um, even though it'll benefit me personally a great deal, this thing to cut the income tax on Social Security benefits, you know, plays right into that <laughs> yeah it's it's speaking to the actual crowd that is in the stands yeah as opposed to uh say cutting you know r- forgiving student debt or some other kind of uh, uh panacea to younger people all right that leaves mr gilstrap <clears throat> i i think with all respect to i think the question is flawed in the sense that you're focusing on West Virginia, and of course, focusing on what, that's what the show is about. But I think if we were doing a show anywhere in Montana or in Iowa or Nebraska or any relatively rural so-called flyover area, the question would resonate the same way. And what those issues are, I don't know. That's not an area of, of study that, I, that I've, involved, I've been involved with. So I, I, I have no real a definitive answer, but I do have feelings about this, and this has kind of been touched on here. Uh, I will tell you that I am the over 65-year-old transplant who came here fleeing the social issues of my lifelong home in Northern Virginia. And uh, all of my neighbors, I shouldn't say all, the vast majority of the neighbors with whom I've spoken in my new neighborhood where not a lot of the houses are built yet, 
but most of the property is owned. All of them are refugees. The vast majority of them are refugees from either Maryland or Virginia who are fleeing the very things that we're talking about, which are, which are the social issues. Uh, yes, everybody's got uh, votable money in their pockets. Everybody is in a certain position in their lives. But <clears throat> that is, West Virginia was the magnet for me and my family and, and those friends. I think as far as the state is concerned and the legislature, there's only so much that a legislature can do. And I think what happened over the years, and again, I've been here for two years, but I've been next door for, for my whole life in, in Virginia. And what I have seen historically is a state that has been uh, historically unfriendly to business. It's never been high on the list of best education or high value of education. There's been a very strong, uh, the, the, the dependence on fossil fuel production, and there's a war on fossil fuels. So West Virginia has had historically many, many problems. Maybe they've reached the tipping point. Nothing is ever uh, irrecoverable. But I think now we got a problem of, and I've, I've, we tried to approach this with, with uh, people on the station here. We want to bring in more businesses. Absolutely. If I had an elementary school age child and I had a choice between working at the, the factory of my choice, I was in the explosives business. So if there's an explosives plant here in West Virginia as opposed to one in Virginia, I would probably choose the one in Virginia simply because I've got a little kid who has to be educated. So, but if enough people go ahead and take that risk, that puts pressure on the school systems to improve and more kids, if you get families who value education, more kids go to school and, you know, and that, that lifts all the ships. But right now we got this Gordian knot of problems of, of which comes first and everything affects everything else. I think the legislation is trying. I think there's, there's a, um, an election year palsy on the, the legislature this year. Last year, I thought they were pretty, you know, pretty aggressive. You can agree or disagree with what they did, but I thought they were pretty aggressive in their efforts. This time sees, seems a little bit um, uh, timid, but uh, and I don't agree with everything that they put through, but I don't, I don't think it's fair to blame the flight on the legislature. Back to you, Joseph. Well, uh, John, since you spoke last, I'll, I'll respond to what you said. Uh, and, and looking at polling as to uh, where these folks choose to live, the Gen Z crowd, uh, they look at uh, infrastructure in the state. They look at educational opportunities. They look at economic diversity and opportunity. And they also look at uh, climate and outdoor pursuits. And let's just say in, in terms of that last uh, criteria, West Virginia fares pretty well. But if we look at where they're moving now, statistically, you, you talked about some other states where this might be uh, also an issue. Uh, surprisingly, Nebraska, Utah, and Idaho are some of the more popular states where these folks are, are relocating. And I think they're doing it because those states and others are showing uh, that they believe in improving their infrastructure. We still lag in Internet access. That That's that's just unforgivable. We, that should not be the case. We, we lack in some of the physical infrastructure yet. And in some of the, 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 the infrastructure that involves people, like our social networks, our, our social agencies, we know they're in, some of them are in disarray. Uh, educational opportunities, we just watched WVU, our flagship university, have to uh, lay off pro professors and cut some of their uh, academic courses. Uh, economic diversity and opportunity. Who can explain the backlash against form energy? Why? Because Bill Gates is involved in it. I mean, that was silly. Uh, but that's the kind of jobs and the kind of of economic development that these folks are looking for. Is the state going to continue to support that, or are we going to throw that around like a political football? Uh, I I just see some problems with how this legislature is approaching some of these issues. They seem to be ignoring them uh, for the sake of other issues that really are not appealing to this Gen Z crowd. So I think we've got some work to do to convince these folks that West Virginia is going to be someplace in the future where they can locate and, and raise a family. Anybody have anything else for Joe? That being the case, uh, Joe, I'll ask you to grade this first segment top to bottom. From the, the opening of the segment to the close, what would you give the grade? Oh, you mean with the, I have to include the Karnak? You have to include from everything segment. from 835 uh, to 9. Well, I, I just, as I listened to the Karnak thing, I, I, the thought that came to my mind was, where can you get such entertainment for free? 
You know, that, that's that you, you get what you pay for is, is really ultimately what this comes down to. And, and you thought it was entertaining from your perspective. You should have been in studio, Joe. <laughs> and, you know, it doesn't doesn't hurt that everybody who knows who Karnak was is dead. Is 65 years old. Or older. <laughs> so here we are playing into the same dynamic. I, I think I. I, I explained this to John Gilstrap one, one day when he had stayed after on the show. We Sometimes we'll talk for a little while. And I said, you have to understand, everything that is done here is done for my own amusement. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, take me out, Ed. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsor. Next up is, I have no idea, I guess it would be Bill's Double Field and his topic. That's not bad. Uh, tune in today. You can find Gil's job. He'll be emceeing Star Search next week. <laughs> it's time for Eastern Panhandle Talk with Rob Mario. Thank you, Cliff Maxwell. Welcome back to the program. We are produced by the sports doctor, Colin McLaughlin, and brought to you in part by the Mansion Ferretti Law Firm. I could tell you about them, or I could let Joe do that himself. Joe? Rob, we're located in beautiful downtown Martinsburg at 408 West King Street. If you have questions about uh, personal injury or insurance claims, you can contact us at 304-264-8505 or visit us on the web at WV justicelawyers.com. It's great to sit back and collect commissions while he actually does the work. <laughs> Joe, thank you. Yeah, I have to I want to revisit my contract. <laughs> <laughs> Too late, it's ironclad. Unbreakable. Uh, this is uh, this date 1974. The Watergate scandal 7. Uh, gentlemen, I presume they were all gentlemen as it was 1974 are charged with conspiracy to obstruct justice. That was the Nixon White House, of which Michael Carl was once a member. Did you know any of those seven, Mike? I'd probably been around them, but uh, I, I was long gone by the time that came up. I mean, I, that's the story you've been going with. Yeah, I, 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 I left. I left in '71. <laughs> once he got wind of the break in plans, out the door. <laughs> got to go now. On to issue number two, and for that, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Uh, yeah, Rob, I submitted four potential issues. Uh, three of the four have been discussed to some degree this morning. Uh, let me put my camera on. I was looking at Larry Schultz. and. Uh, yeah, there you go. Okay. That's always disturbing. That's always. Yeah, yeah, yeah I lost my chain yeah, of thought after need, seeing Larry Schultz. You don't Schultz. need two pictures of me on. <laughs> That's right, yeah. So anyway, three of the four have been discussed. So this is the only one. The others had been kind of a statewide focus. This is a national focus. It's coming up with the election. Uh, border security, the economy, women's rights are being heavily debated. And I'm about to be refocused. Okay. Uh, have been heavily debated. Uh, one that is not getting a lot of attention that I think could really be a key to the election in, uh, in the fall, and that is a Palestine-Gaza Palestine, issue. Uh, Michigan held their uh, primary this past week. Uh, there was a group that was protesting against President Biden's handling of the Israeli-Palestine war, and they did that by uh, voting uncommitted. Uh, Thirteen percent of all the Michigan voters in the primary voted uncommitted. In other words, they were protesting Biden's position. That's in excess of 100,000. Last election, 2020, uh, Biden beat Trump by only 154,000. If this if this uh, trends holds true uh, in the in the, to the fall. A key, key state, a swing state, very well may be swung to the uh, to the Trump side as opposed to the Biden side, only because of this one issue. Uh, my question to uh, uh, to my panelists is: uh, is is this something that really is of great concern, or do you think that other issues, border security, economy, and women's rights, uh, will will actually take the uh, uh, the upper hand? All right, let's lead off with the social assassin. John Gilstrap. Assassin. If, if the question is, do I think that this is going to be a, a big factor in, as opposed to the, the, the justification of what's going on, I'll, I'll treat them separately. I don't think it's a big factor in Republican voters. I think it's a big factor in Democrat voters. And for reasons, everybody has their own reasons going into this. This is the only, I shouldn't say, it's one of the few stances that President Biden has taken that I actually agree with. I've, he's taken a principled stance 
uh, in in favor of Israel and allowing Israel to defend itself. And if he were, he, he's put himself in an interesting spot because of of uh, being the leader of the Democratic Party. Clearly, uh, if we believe what the people who turn out to protest, a huge portion of his party is opposed to this one issue. And I think it will be a, a pivotal issue for him. Uh, but if he were to change his mind, then he telegraphs to the world that he doesn't take a principled stand on an issue such as this. So I, th I think he's in a corner and I think it's going to have a, a bad effect on, on his election chances. Larry Schultz. I'm not so sure that um, it will have a bad effect. I think um, what Bill raises as an issue, you can't certainly deny that uh, a lot of people in Michigan voted uncommitted. I believe, as he has done before, that Joe Biden will find some sort of solution and calm this problem. You know, we have this tendency, and it goes on and on and on, to suggest that Mr. Biden's not capable. But there's an awful lot of legislation and an awful lot of good economic results uh, that suggest otherwise. So I agree, if he can't do anything about it, it could be a problem. But I've given up uh, the, the idea that there's things that Joe Biden can't do anything about. Uh, because he's done some things that have been amazing, actually, um, in terms of the lowest unemployment in my lifetime, uh, in terms of other uh, things. You know, I was actually reading that the homicide rate for 2023 is predicted to be, when they finalize the numbers, some 10 percent lower than 2022. That strikes against the whole border question, and we'll guess we'll get into that later. But uh, there's a number of things that Mr. Biden has done and that have occurred during his term, whether you think he did them or not, that he will get credit for that may balance this off. Only one man can follow Larry Schultz, and that man is wearing a blue blazer, and his name is Michael Carl. Well, uh, I will say that, that Biden's support of Israel defending itself is one of the few things that I support Biden for that he's done and he's doing. And uh, I, I, I just hold my breath that, that uh, in all these machinations that uh, either Trump or, or some of the crazies in the Republican House don't you know, undermine the support of, of, of Israel just because they're playing games. You know. But basically they've, they've, they've stood up pretty well too. But, but – uh, uh, it, it, it's a serious problem for Biden, but I think he would lose a lot more votes by backing away and you know qualifying and limiting his support of Israel than 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 by standing where he is. There's only one man that can follow Michael Carl, and I don't know what he's wearing. Joe Ferretti. Uh, the Michigan results from last week do point out the imperative that. President Biden has to, to somehow uh, navigate this very difficult issue. And I, I see two problems on the horizon for the president. Number one is we're about to start seeing images of starving children and a humanitarian crisis in the Gaza Strip, which is going to be unsettling. And the second thing that you see developing is that Bibi Netanyahu seems to be uh, less tethered to U.S. policy and U.S. influence than at any time during this conflict. And so I, I, I wonder to what extent President Biden is going to be able to have uh, some influence and effect over what's going on over there. And I also wonder how we're going to deal with this as a society when we start seeing these images. So it is a vexing problem for the president. Michigan points out the importance of, of having some sort of solution. Uh, I, that's why you hear about efforts for at a ceasefire. Uh, the, the, the president knows he's got to do something. And uh, my question is, though, what his capability is going to be, given that um, Netanyahu seems to be uh, really inclined to press forward at, at uh, significant cost to uh, some of the innocents over there. And, and it's, it's just a tough problem. To, and I don't know where the solution is going to come from, but 
uh, the president's going to need something before the election in November. Bill comes back to you. Yeah, uh, there's another uh, another image is over 30,000 have been killed in Gaza. Uh, And the world is, with the exception of a couple of countries, U.S. being one, the world's raising up uh, with their their concern with this huge number. I do not believe and picking up a little bit on what John Gilscraft said, I do not believe this is going to be an issue in probably 47 states. But it could well be an issue in those one or two or three swing states.